So, hello. Uh, I woke up this morning and I found out I'm moderating a panel. Hello! <laughs> nice to meet everybody. What's the panel about? <laughs> okay, so I might be a little bit rusty, so I will try to... But the great thing is I have great people with me. Um, they're just, you know, just fabulous people. Really, just great people. Um, and uh, and so I'm filling in for the for the great uh, Eric Carvin, who is uh, with the Associated Press. Uh, and we're to the, 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 this panel um, is about how you you get emotional. <laughs> really, how, how do we get? How do we use emotion? to build audiences. So special, uh, special interest publishers have shown how inspirational, uplifting content that sparks emotion in audiences can inspire super sharing. And so we want to unpack that and learn all about that and how that works. So first, the question is, as was noted in the, in the prior discussion, where do you draw the line between kind of emotional content that's real and authentic and what could be seen as manipulation, or or just how do you balance that? How do you know, you know, the you know when do you go? How far can you push there before it becomes seen as as manipulation and not just emotional content? Are you asking me? I'm asking everybody. Um, <laughs> well, you know, I. I I can't, you yeah. know, I, I have to hold it back here to read. I, I, um, I guess at little things, what we've learned, and I think where we draw the line is that the emotion that I don't like to play on is uh, shocking for the state, for the sake of being shocking, and then also just, you know, infuriating and fear mongering content. Um, so we made a pretty significant pivot um, to add the word meaningful to our definition. And this was after um, I ran the story of Amran, who was that little boy. Um, and I ran it in context to with a video of a newscaster breaking down as she was reporting on this little boy who's sitting there in shock. And Little Thing's mission was feel good, uplifting, inspiring content at the time. And so I got an email saying, Maya, this wasn't feel good. And I had run, I'd run something by them earlier that day, which was like about the shape of the clitoris, because I was like, it's good for women, but and they're like, why did you run this by us and not, and I'm talking about the founder, and why not this like war piece, essentially. And I said, because it's meaningful and our audience cares and our audience needs to see it. However, running a video, the line for me is like running a video and there was, it happened a couple of years ago, but I always remember this and I talk about this with my editorial team of a mother being swallowed by an escalator as she pushes her son to safety is, the line. Like now we're publishing someone's death, a video of someone's death, which is exploitative, and we're creating this false sense of fear that like, you know, the escalator is gonna swallow you and you should never ride an escalator again. Now I think it's okay to have a healthy fear of escalators, but do I want people to, you know, be traumatized by something that we run on little things? No. So I think that's where we draw the line. Yeah. I, I didn't introduce the panelists, I'm sorry. So this is uh, this is uh, Maya from Little Things. Uh, Mina from Bloomberg and uh, Renan from MTV, MTV News. Sorry. <laughs> so you had a you wanted to weigh in on that? Yeah, I I, I was gonna say I, you know a couple of years ago, I think like the the trend was like the you won't believe or this will give you all the feels and I think like we started to feel like our our community is is very vocal and um, if they don't like what we put out there, they don't like a headline or they don't like the tone, we get like, why don't you play music videos anymore? And I, I don't want to hear this from you. Um, so tone is, tone is super important for us um, because they, they can smell inauth inauthenticity, you know what I mean? So like, it, it's very important for us. And, and the great thing is that like our staff of writers and people that create videos, they are, you know, they're the peers of the people that we want to be reading and, and watching our, our videos. And so, you know, we, we try to tap into like the, the actual enthusiasm we have for uh, a specific thing. Like our, we have a writer that uh, is now, I guess, Twitter buds with The Rock. And he tweets at her all the time. And every time she jumps into Slack, she's like, oh my god, The Rock tweeted at me again. Um, and so like, whenever she writes about you know, the, the very important and Oscar-winning Fast and the Furious franchise, like, you, know, you can really feel her enthusiasm for it. It doesn't feel like hyperbole just to you know, try to, try to 
get clicks, you know? We now know the one person who saw Baywatch, which is great. <laughs> she definitely did. And she liked That's, it more uh, than I'm most sure of the he thanks for that. So, um, <laughs> Mina, you, this is something you think about. Yes. So, so you look like you're deep in thought. So uh, tell us. I was thinking about the new Baywatch and that there's someone that, who's watching. <laughs> That's right. Maybe we all need to go see that as a flash <laughs> trip today to help the rock out. Um, he doesn't need any help. But how um, how do you think about emotion bait, in, especially kind of in, in a business context? Well, I think it's about being fair and being accurate in what you're saying. If you say something like, you know, my gosh, this market is crashing, and you're like, well, it's gone down a little bit today. Are we going overboard? And I think really it's more than anything making sure that you're being accurate and true to your content and not taking things a step too far to drive virality or shares or engagement or anything like that. Okay, and um, how, do you inject emotional uh, context? To, how much of the business content that you're creating on, on the Bloomberg channels are you, think, are you in some way infusing with emotion versus just straight up? Well, I think there are some things where there are natural emotional elements, like this CEO went from getting fired to creating this amazing business empire that speaks to aspiration, inspiration, encouragement, motivation, things like that. So I think there it makes sense to bring out that. But for something like here are the monthly job numbers or this is the report on wholesale inventories and what it means for the economy, I think that's going to be much harder and you can try and push it too far and that's what we try and not do. How much do you think the, the users, the audiences, if you will, are aware of the emotional button that's sometimes being um, pushed by the, by the press as a group? Um, or any content creators, really? It's a, it's a good question. I, it makes me think Is of, it more it, awareness or less awareness? It, like, I feel like our audience can smell if we're trying to talk about an artist that they don't care about, right? Like, they want to hear about Harry Styles in One Direction or about, you know, Rihanna. But, like, if we are talking about, I don't want to name any names, but somebody who is sort of less beloved by the uh, social media stands on Facebook and Twitter, then, you know, they'll tell us and they sniff it out and they're like, this sucks, this person sucks. And <laughs> we stop writing about them. And, you know, we try to... Try to take note um, so we make sure that we don't uh, upset the stands again. Yeah, I mean, I think for, for us, you know, using the wrong word to describe an emotion in a headline, and we're, we've actually really scaled back using any, like, you know, the word shocked, stunned, um, unbelievable. Those words, when, the, when you go to the story and it's not unbelievable, are frowned upon, and as they should be. And I think that people have gotten a lot smarter about what they're consuming on social. Um, I think that <laughs> publishers abuse the word unbelievable, <laughs> like a lot. <laughs> so now if something, you can't even, I can't even use it when something is unbelievable, and that's frustrating, <laughs> because there's some stuff that happens that is just you know tremendous and unbelievable. Like people can turn their lives around in amazing ways, um, but now that's kind of become a dirty word. So I think being really sensitive to language and there's, you know, everybody will say a clickbait headline in the same way and it's what happens next, unbelievable. <laughs> and so even using what happens next seems to arouse this like anger and this feeling of being misled in people. So we try to stay away from that. Do you think clickbait just in general is gonna start to kind of go the way of the, of the dodo given just that everything's kind of moving away from clicking over to things and really being kind of meant to be consumed in feed as a, a, the you know as the now this folks showed us with a with the contents meant to be you know discovered at the point of discovery i mean i think based on the signals we get from our friends at facebook i feel like they have have the, the few things that they have said publicly is that they're going to start shifting the way that they um, that they, the way they surface things in the news feed based on how long people are reading an article, how much they're engaging with the article, obviously, and then how long people are watching videos. And I think, you know, one of the things that we're already seeing, like a couple, you know, maybe at some point last year, you could take a six second video and just loop it on Facebook for an hour and it would the engagement would be through the roof. Mm -hmm. And it already seems like they're sort of self-correcting um, for, for that type of loophole. And, I, you know, they, they've been very forward with this and they're trying to get original series and all these different um, new types of more premium content on Facebook. And I think it's going to, you know, if you have a longer video and that engages people, I, I have to assume that, you know, we're going to see that stuff become more successful on Facebook and stuff that feels like, Clickbait, or you know, the video equivalent of clickbait, like that stuff is going to, I think, perform worse. And I think we might already be seeing that. 
I, I think what's changed too is that if you're creating an article, I think that um, there are use cases for just going direct to feed and creating a Facebook native video for something. And then there are stories that are better told by an article. And what we've noticed is that um, very, very recently, a lot of our original content writers have been writing, you know, have been trying like the military diet or trying, um, you know, consuming the actual allotted amount of water, which is ridiculous per day, or like no coffee. Terrible things that the writers are trying, and I'm so grateful to them. Um, but when they try these, that story is better told with their emotions and writing, photographs, they're using Snapchat, we're pulling Snapchat images into an article. Could we do that in a video? Yeah, but then you can't speed through it if you just want to like, you know, see certain things or like you have certain questions about it. So there are still some stories that are better told in article form. Um, but what we're finding now as a company in general is that we're starting to have to give the writers more time per piece, um, which is challenging but also exciting because that means that the writing that they're doing, the more successful articles are a little bit more researched, they're longer, and it's better writing, which is exciting for someone that was a digital first publisher where you know, initially we were publishing a few lines of content and a video curated from YouTube, and now that's totally pivoted. But I think it's a good pivot, and I'm more proud of the content now than I ever was. Any lessons on kind of what you've learned that's not working? Um, I think trying to trick people and trying to go after them emotionally when it's like there's really nothing about this. Is there this. a story you can share? Or, or um, well, I always can, discourage the tricking of the people. You can, I like you can, to be very you can, authentic. You can, redact, and, you can redact all the, you know, the people. Well, uh, I don't really know of any that we've actually gotten to fruition where something has gone out, but I think... You have idea, ideas being generated, you mean? There's some times that I think right. a lot of people mm -hmm. are like, oh, well, you know, if we put it this way, this would be mm -hmm. really shareable, but it's not true to the story, it's not authentic. And I think what you see with ClickBait is you can only trick your audience so long before they get wise to it. So you don't really want to be doing that with the content that you're putting out either. either. You just want to present it honestly and let good content speak for itself. You mentioned something that was really interesting. You have, it sounds like a blacklist of words. Yes. That you stopped using. It sounds like it's, a, it's an inverse dictionary. Yes. Um, I want that. Uh, it, was, it was released by Facebook. Yeah. yeah so Facebook released the, the, the list of words. I think they did it in um, August of last year. And we were using those words as a publisher. I'm very open about this. We were using them so frequently that the Friday that we found out that this was happening, um, it was me, our director of publishing, and a few other people. <laughs> we stayed in a conference room until pretty late that night retitling everything that was supposed to be scheduled for the weekend. Yeah. And then I laid down on the office floor and I was like, it's all, it's all over. <laughs> and I woke up in the morning and I was like, we're, no, 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 it's going to be OK. We're like more like a tabloid now. And then I got excited because as a kid, I really consumed a lot of tabloid content. And I'm like, but I'm a happy tabloid. And then like a gift from God that morning, there was a story about a man who had two obituaries in the same newspaper. One from his wife, one from his girlfriend. Oh, that was and awesome. that's the type of thing, like kind of funny story that our audience would get really excited about and that went viral immediately. And the headline was straightforward, didn't use any of the blacklist words. And I was like, there's a way to still be enticing. We just have to be smarter and work harder. Do you maintain lists of words that you, I mean, beyond what Facebook has done, you know, kind of like, almost like anti-style guides? Well, I mean, I think you know the traditional mechanisms of clickbait, and Facebook pretty much laid out these examples, and you can substitute whatever type of content you're putting in. Mm -hmm. But I think it's generally, we all know, and we've all clicked on things where it's like, God, I can't believe I just wasted a click on that. So I think <laughs> anything that's structured like that, we try and avoid, and I think we've all kind of consume them at some point in time and have a general idea of what the structures are. Yeah. You won't believe. You are not even going to guess this. <laughs> you can't even fathom. Yeah. Mm -hmm. you, you mentioned the tabloids, which I think is a great yeah. metaphor to look at. And you know, I go back to the New York Post, the famous headline, the headless uh, body found in the topless bar. Um, it's actually kind of one of the most iconic uh, uh, headlines of the New York Post. Where, do you look? To, how do? You, where do you get inspiration from and in looking for what's appropriate to do in this world? Do you pull it from the tabloid world? Do you pull it from television? Do you pull it from users? What? What do you? What do you look for? Kind of inspiration on how to, on, on where you can pull the emotional lever. Um, you know, I look at magazines a good bit and like the way that they title stuff on... You sit at the supermarket. That's a great place. Supermarket is a great place. I, you know, honestly, sometimes the, for my audience, looking at a Reader's Digest in my mom's bathroom at home, I'm like, whoa. Um, I look at the stuff my mom shares on Facebook, but Reader's Digest, they have... You look at the cover of Reader's Digest, I don't care how old you are, 
And there's something in there that you're like, I should know that information. And it's not, it's not the least bit clickbaity, but it's like that's, that's valuable. I need to know what's going on with my colon. Like as, as a human in this world, maybe I should have that information. We do, we're grateful too. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I think like I, our answer to that, I mean, just to give a shout out to our wonderful hosts. I mean, News Whip, like it's such a powerful way to see, you know, the headlines all, like all the pub, all the headlines a, a, a publisher might run, or if like it's topic specific, we can actually dig in and figure out like how the same story was covered across multiple publications, and we can see like oh, EW covered it this way, uh, Vice covered it this way, Buzzfeed covered it this way, and sort of look and see how our headlines compare to theirs. Figure out like for a particular story or a set of stories, like what, what headlines and what types of levers worked best. Um, and then we try to learn from it and figure out like what would our approach be? What do we like? What could we incorporate while still maintaining the MTV news voice, um, which is a distinct voice on its own as well. Are there, are there areas now where you refuse to touch and put any emotion at all, given the political climate, given the way that, you know, that <clears throat> different types of interpretations on stories that you think could be uplifting may not be? Um, are there areas where you just were shutting that down and now, you know, any kind of emotional content in that specific area? Yeah, um, from a politics perspective, um, we quickly, we've got this like giant unruly community on, on Facebook where it's like global and it's sort of hard to control, which, you know, I spend a lot of like sleepless nights um, thinking about, but we quickly, we quickly, quickly learned that people didn't necessarily want like political snark from us. You know, that, that's like, th we'd get that and you know, we'd have people in the comments telling us that we were you know, too liberal or that like, we didn't know what we were talking about or go back to playing music videos or you know, whatever. Um, we, we get that a lot. It's like a daily thing. Um, but like, you know, we, MTV News has been covering politics since, you know, the, the, since like, Bill Clinton was running for president. So it's like, really ingrained in our DNA and it's super important to us and our audience to cover those sorts of things. But we found, particularly from a video perspective and then occasionally from an article perspective as well, that people don't want the snarkiness from us. They don't want like these really sort of dramatic and bombastic headlines. They sort of just want us to lay things out like directly and for us to tell them why it's important without like, you know, subtweets to the Trump administration like in a, in a subhead or something. Uh, uh, what about when there's like a major global event? Uh, I'm curious how a uh, a little things might react, you know, when there's a, a, a terrorism attack mm -hmm. or, or, or something dramatic happens, and you and you feel like you have to take a breather for for, for 24 hours or whatever. How do you how do you manage that in that process? Um, you know, we will we will react. It's it's subtle, but you will see us take out. I mean, we have um, Christina Kuzmich, who's our truth bomb mom, um, makes videos for us, and she made a video about talking to your kids about death and the bombing in Manchester happened and you know we made the decision that that was, it wasn't the right time because some of it was like you know death happens like that was her like you have to talk about it but when something like that happens we have to change our schedule for posting and while we don't speak to politics at all we try to absolutely not make any political commentary because we don't cover hard news um, we try to be the antidote so what we will do and after I think the terrorist attacks in Paris we, um, we did cover stories about people doing demonstrations about peace and love as a reaction, but we didn't provide the gory details. You know, in the, in the um, article copy, it wasn't like this, this many people died in this way. It was after the tragedy, we will kind of not glaze over it, but we'll address it, but kind of try to address like, here's some hope though. Um, and what actually happens with us, because we're not competing for those stories and those hard news stories is we will see sometimes a bump in traffic because we are the thing in your newsfeed that you go to when you can't possibly read anything more about whatever the president did or um, the terrorism. Yeah. And how do you look at the different platforms and kind of handcrafting your content for each one of them? I mean, Mina, you have some thoughts here, I think. Uh, yeah, definitely. Uh, for us, certain content performs better on certain platforms, so we look to make sure we're highlighting the right content on the right platforms and to whatever extent we can at the right times. But we don't try and force everything on every platform because our audiences are different, formats are different, the way people consume 
content is different. And I think that people can tell if you are cutting corners and just putting the same thing up everywhere. And I think that their communities tend to appreciate it if you cater to the way content is consumed on the specific platform. And so how do you slice and dice the emotional aspect of each different platform? Not every platform, you don't have to name every one, but how do you look at them? Well, I think you try and cater to whichever ones most fit your brand. For example, something like Instagram works for business brands a little bit better than you might think because a lot of business content speaks to people who aspire to do things, who are looking for inspiration, who are looking for motivation, who might be looking for education and things like that. So there is a way to appeal to that element on Instagram. But on Twitter, the finance audience seems much more interested in market movements, economic news, what's happening right now, getting unfiltered, unbiased information on the ground, and less so about finding those inspirational stories, at least among our content. So it would be pushing a story of a certain kind, perhaps harder on Instagram than we might on Twitter, pushing some things on Twitter that would never make it onto Instagram. Do your users look to you to push the envelope in any way? in this area and are they egging you on to do so or, or do they how do they feel about that when you try to when you try to kind of push the boundary? Um, you know, we're pleasantly surprised I think by our audience in terms of when we try to push the boundaries. We we use Facebook Live as our platform to experiment with new types of content. And we launched a show on Facebook Live called The Beyond um, and it airs at nine PM on Thursdays. And it was a passion product or a passion project of some of the producers on the live. And I was like, if you guys want to stay until 10 o'clock at work, be, be my guest. Um, and the beyond is about, you know, are mermaids real? Could mermaids be possible? Um, what, how about wait, unicorns? Wait, wait, wait. Why not? Aren't they? <laughs> I mean, so a lot of our audience is like very into debating Don't ruin it. it for me. And that doesn't <laughs> fall into the definition of little things. I think if you, at, at face value, it doesn't fall under that. But this show does, on average, 125,000 views on Facebook Live, and it's, you know, it's a branded show. It's not us trying to explode a watermelon. So our audience is telling us they are genuinely interested in like talking about Bigfoot, and it's that's not where you would necessarily see us. But then again, our audience is the same audience that watches Investigation Discovery, so it it makes sense. So they're eager for us to push the envelope. But when we see them respond negatively, and I've seen them respond not so positively, I think, to our pop culture show, where we're, it's almost like we're kind of trying to be another publisher, like a little too hip. Then if, if we try to force something down their throats, like you guys are saying, like, we can't be MTV. I can't compete with you about music news. And they, they're just telling us they don't want us to. Um, and it's nice that Facebook allows comments, because you hear that. So, so we're mostly talking about kind of making people feel <clears throat> uplifted in some way. Do you ever try by design to get people feeling angry? I don't think I need to nowadays. <laughs> well, but maybe, I mean, you know. I mean, I think the way the world that, is. I would argue just... that Teen Vogue in some ways by kind of covering mm -hmm. news in a, in a, with a certain kind of style and, a, and, and certain teeth. They're trying to get people, I don't think they're trying to get people riled up, but they are. And, uh, and, it's, and, and people are taking notice of that. So do you ever try to go in and, when you think about emotional storytelling, do you ever feel like, well, I'm going to, I'm going to throw a fire into you know, I'm going to, into this onto the gas here or no? I mean, I think Team Vogue is a great example. Um, I you know to go back on our, our politics note, like we see a bunch of publishers that are really succeeding with strongly voiced and worded political commentary, and it's not always the sites that you think of. It is like it's Teen Vogue, it's Rolling Stone, it's um, GQ and Esquire, where they have strong voices like Matt Taibbi or Charlie Pierce or Lauren Duca that are writing these really incisive pieces about politics. And you know, when we tried to, you know, sort of adopt like that that sort of structure of a headline or a video that is more incisive and more outrage, we quickly found that. That, that wasn't working for us and, and people got mad at us. And you know, while, while it'd be nice to sort of cut people loose, like we quickly heard from our audience that that's, that's not what they were looking for from us. Um, and so, yeah, we were pretty much talked, talked out of that corner pretty, pretty quickly. <laughs> I'm told by the good Irish people that are hosting us that uh, we are, uh, I'm sorry, uh, that we are, uh, you could say that the good, the good Jewish person on the panel, uh, that, uh, that we're to take questions. Dr. Mays? Um, I had brought up um, conveying emotion in our form versus video. It's an interesting point. Is there, for uh, non journalists like me, is there is there a new definition mm -hmm. of what long form 
looks like today? Is, is, is long term now a different meaning now? Still exist? Is that what, what, is, what is that consistent? Yeah, I mean, I think in, I, I, I overuse the word long form, and I mean, in terms of long form content for little things, I define that for an article as anything that's longer than a 200 word write up into a little video. So anything that comes out of our original content team, I think it's around 700 to 1,000 words, um, usually in gallery form. That's a piece of long form article content. As far as long form video, um, I mean, we define long form video as anything that's over four minutes. Um, and then long form programming is like 20 minutes plus. So it, it just depends on the way I'm using the, the word. But like my long form is probably a lot shorter than the Atlantic's. Yeah. Every place I've worked, the word long form has been a complete different length. And I think yeah. yours and my definition of long form in our organizations are much different. Yes. <laughs> Other questions? Yes. So, in my experience when writing articles about emotion, it's usually an extreme kind of emotion. And whenever there's this kind of superlative, you really do have to walk the line between clickbait and marketing. Mm -hmm. uh, you mentioned not using the word shopping and whatnot, um, but that's key. But how else do you go about making sure that the article is centered on the emotion and not the draw, so just the experience? I mean, that's, that's a good question. I think that um, we will focus on the aspect of, and something that we do is we, we push the aspect of the piece that is the most important. So if there is truly something shocking, you can be honest about it, and if it's compelling enough, people will still look at it and read the article. So, you know, at a very base level, something like a, a daughter fitting into her mom's prom dress or her grandma's prom dress 45 years later and looking absolutely phenomenal, you're going to want to see, like, the, the, the grandma in the prom dress and the girl in the prom dress without saying, and the result, shocking. Um, and, you know, in... in <laughs> You can just say, like, granddaughter puts on her grandma's 45-year-old prom dress yeah. and looks like a movie star. And that's not saying it's shocking or t assigning an emotion to the reader. That's letting the reader decide whether or not, first of all, they're interested in seeing a girl that they don't know look like a movie star. And honestly, to me, even, like, talking about that, I'm like, I'm curious about that because I'm curious about, um, you know, vintage clothing. And I didn't have that opportunity, so I'd like to see that. So... Yeah, yeah. I, I think like it gives me more choice over like which emotions I'm going to respond with as well because I can either say, all right, there's the nostalgia element mm -hmm. or there's the family element mm -hmm. or something like that. So that's a little bit more in my court as the reader or consumer. Yeah. I, I, our, our headlines and content tend to be like a little more voicey, but like for us, I think a big part of it has been listening to our audience. Like it's easy to you know, see when people are making fun of you um, for, for something. So like a couple of years ago, I think we were like starting to overuse the term literally unrecognizable. Uh, and it's like, oh, you know, uh, Lady Gaga got a makeover and she looks completely unrecognizable. And then I think we got to one day where it was like, Katy Perry looks completely unrecognizable. And then like people made fun of us because she just changed like the color of her hair. And we were like, all right, all right. Maybe we should pull back and only pull that one out of the holster when somebody actually looks. Do you know that's what? great because your users will definitely use social to tell you oh, yeah. things and to lots. call you out <laughs> incredibly quickly. <laughs> the new thing that I've noticed p um, publishers like in your space doing that's driving me a little bit bonkers mm -hmm. is telling me that someone all of a sudden got thick and the internet's freaking out over it, like which is like, look at this celebrity who gained weight. Oh, yeah, ooh. thick with two Cs. And it's, it's like completely... <laughs> And the way the articles are written, I'm not going to name the publisher, but the articles are written like, being thick is great, but it's like, you are shamelessly showing us body transformation pictures and framing it in a way, it's gawking at women's bodies. So Yeah, I don't think our music and talent department would be happy with us calling anybody thick. Yeah, uh, we're trying to be body positive. That's you know? good. It's not you guys. It's definitely not you. Tara. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, at Little Things, my deputy editor here is here. We have a strict policy kind of against um, calling out brands unless they are sponsoring a piece of content because we'll only be positive about them. 
so to me, we, we didn't cover the unicorn frappuccino. Um, first of all, everybody was. And also, like, for us, I would rather do, I think that with the unicorn frappuccino, too, it, was, it wasn't brand safe in that people were like, this tastes terrible. I did not personally try it because I consume sugar from elsewhere. But the, um, the unicorn frappuccino itself wouldn't have been brand safe. I would love to personally work with Starbucks. I like their own <coughs> milk lattes if Starbucks is here. Um, <laughs> so we won't cover anything with the brand, so we can't jump on that bandwagon. It does drive our writers nuts sometimes because they do use, you know, this, they use Spike and News Whip, and they're like, but this is trending, and Lena has to be the one to be like, but you can't cover it because Maya will get mad. Um, unless it's being sponsored. But when it's being sponsored, different story. Well, you know, 10 things like you didn't know about Cracker Barrel. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, uh, we, we have a style beat, um, and MTV also has been covering style for many, many years, uh, reaching back to House of Style, and um, it's, it's led by this brilliant editor, Haley, Haley Melodic. And, you know, the, the brands actually are like a big part of, of what we do because, you know, when Kendall Jenner has a new line of, of shoes, that um, that she's working to create, or you know, Kylie has a new lip kit or something like that's stuff our audience cares about, and we see it in the numbers. That stuff blows up. If Zendaya wears a thirty-eight dollar dress on the red carpet, like that, that was huge for us. So you know, we like we'll we'll write about it like when it makes sense within the context of the, the people our audience are most into. Um, which if it it helps if their last name is Jenner or Kardashian. I have to look those up. Thank you. Give me some names to look up. I didn't know about that one. Yes, in the back. What do you do if you upset your audience? Do you engage with them, or do you ignore it, or do you have an experience? So, what do you do when you piss? The question is, what do you do when you piss people off? Well, you didn't say that, but I. Uh, depends on the level. Um, we do have community managers that are going through the comments. We do respond to everybody. Um, we will have meetings about not doing it again. Um, when when we've done things that I feel like are egregious, I'll, I will apologize personally. Um, generally speaking, we we will run into sometimes us will cover a story and um, not realize that someone didn't want it covered because it's been covered by other outlets. Um, so that's usually the kind of upset that we manage. We also with dog stories occasionally like. And it's so hard to train new writers on this. There are certain things. Our audience is very sensitive to animals. So pit bulls with certain style of like tails. And then I, I've trained writers to look to see if there's a shock collar on the dog somewhere. We can't run it. Um, that's Those are conversations we have. We one time ran a video that, and I didn't see the shock collars, but the dogs were wearing shock collars. And the audience became so upset. And we didn't make this video. We ran a story about the dog owner. The audience was so upset that they didn't just email our founder, they emailed like the investors. So they like went to that level. Um, so we now we have rules against like what the dogs can and can't wear. But we try we do our best to make our audience happy. It's really important to us from the foundation of where we came from. Um, when we were when we came from a e-commerce site called Petflow and I managed the social there and we responded to everyone and that's still in our DNA. So you mentioned something that's interesting. Can you train people how to be kind of emotionally intelligent content creators? Or is that just something you're born with and that's the way it is? I mean, I think you can definitely increase your emotional intelligence in both creating content and um, distributing content. And I know that one of the things that we talk about when we talk about virality and shareability is like, what are the reasons someone would share this piece of content? So we try and stay true to the content creation, tell the stories as they are but think about what might really drive the spread of a piece of content. Mm -hmm. So is it like comedy where you, you could treat, you, you, you're either funny or you're not, I and mean, I, I don't know if you can do this. I mean, I feel like people on the internet can smell inauthenticity, mm -hmm. you know? So like, mm -hmm. if somebody isn't comfortable sounding like, you know, a, a, a fangirl or boy mm -hmm. in their, uh, in their headlines, like they don't have to. There's different ways at it. You can make jokes. You can uh, tackle it straight ahead. Like there's lots of different potential ways to to tackle it. But like, you know, what we don't want to do is like have OMG, LOL. I can't believe that, like and have it not feel like legitimate. You know, like we'll save those for the for the really OMG mm -hmm. stuff. But um, you know, I think we're down to just one more question. <coughs> Your editorial team, your 
if you're actually trying to solve the question. Um, I mean, I can answer that. For, uh, at Little Things, most of our editorial team lives in-house, as do our producers, our video producers. Um, and we train by having frequent meetings about it, and also just every single writer and editor is hooked up to the data and is looking at it. And you know, they have weekly meetings to review. They have monthly meetings to review. There's a lot of conversation around the articles that are successful. We don't have conversations around the articles that are not. And I think that we can train anyone, anyone who has a passion for the type of content we can do can be good at it. What, we, what we've not been successful training is if there's a writer who wants to work for hard news that comes and works at little things as like a temp job, it's not, it's not a fit and they're not gonna <coughs> be able to grow a passion for stories of like underdogs at, when they wanna actually be covering politics. So that's the only thing we can't kind of get people in tune with. I'm, I'm the bad guy that makes people come to meetings, mm -hmm. you know, so I make our, our, our video and our editorial teams meet with us probably more often than they'd like. Um, but, you know, just to give another like shout out to News Whip, like, you know, when I first, when we first were able to get access to News Whip's data a couple years ago, um, and the, like the wealth of competitive information there, like nothing resonates more with a creative person than to see like what everybody else is doing, you know? So like for many years, all we did was like, here's how our own stuff did. And here's like how it measured up against our benchmarks. But you show their article versus an article at a similar publication and you compare the two, then you've got their attention. And uh, we try to do that as, as, as often as we can and try to have like really open, honest discussions about why things may have done better or whether we were too late or our headline was good or bad and like have frank discussions about that stuff um, because you know it's not it's not personal it's the internet we find that sending emails works really well so we send a few pretty regular emails a lot of times they'll have screenshots or dissections of why something worked or kind of like if it exemplifies a social best practice we'll use that as an opportunity to remind people particularly if we start to see people slipping into something that's less than optimal so I want to thank you very much for the panel and the time and the questions. Thank you.